Hi, my name is Corey Wren. I'm a professor of sociology. I'm going to be presenting a three-part series on vegan feminism. This was presented to a class I taught on gender roles at Colorado State University. Uh, so this first, this first part of the three parts, I'm going to be looking at how uh, non-human animals are gendered and how their exploitation is a So uh, first, speaking of females, which tend to be probably the most exploited, well, they tend to survive the longest. Um, cows are used to produce milk, and we also use their offspring. That's where veal calves come from. It's from the dairy industry. Uh, chickens are used to produce eggs, and then their offspring are used to uh, take their place once they become spent. Um, pigs, turkeys, and other food animals they're used to produce offspring. So you see in the food industry, um, it's very, very, very gendered because there's a focus on the female reproductive system to produce uh, breast milk and ovulations, which are chicken eggs, and to continue the next uh, generation to keep these industries in business. The dog Okay, so here is an image of a cow with mastitis, about one in four dairy cows have this, it's an infection of the udder because dairy cows have been genetically manipulated so that they produce as much as 10 times what they naturally would. Uh, so we see the female body has been extremely, extremely uh, oppressed and manipulated for capitalist gain. Um, and it should also be considered that it's generally men who run these industries. So it's not only the female bodies are disproportionately being exploited, but there's also actual, it's an actual aspect of patriarchy that we have <clears throat> male farmers generally who are conducting these um, atrocities. Uh, the picture on the bottom is a picture of a cow who's being artificially inseminated, which we can only understand to be rape. This man uh, is putting his arm into her rectum, which pushes down her uterus, and then she is uh, inseminated vaginally with this device. And of course this goes on, all dairy cows experience this. They actually are put on what is known as a rape rack, <clears throat> and that's to Im uh, immobilize them to make sure this procedure goes through smoothly. Other animal species who are used for, um, who are reproduced for our gain, which would include food, experimentation, entertainment, all of those, they all experience this um, forced sex or rape is what it is. It's a sexual violation. Okay, and here are some laying hens. They are either kept in battery cages like this. The vast majority are kept in battery cages where it's like five to six or more hens are kept in a cage that's about the size of a piece of paper, um, like regular 8 by 11 paper. <clears throat> and these hens don't live very long. Uh, and they, are, they undergo forced molting, which means they are starved for several days or more at a time, kept in darkness, and that will force them to ovulate and produce more eggs. And they are forced to produce so many eggs that they, their bodies just can't handle very much of it. So at very young ages, they're sent off to slaughter, and that's what becomes our you know, chicken soup. And so the entire egg industry is built on uh, the exploitation of the female body as well. So in the food industry, too, where animals are raised for their flesh, of course, uh, the mother animals are exploited, so we can produce more and more uh, and as much as possible for the least amount of resources possible. And so you see pigs now are producing really huge litters. Um, this is a picture of a gestation crate where pigs are confined for their, the entire length of their pregnancy. They can't even turn around. Pigs are very intelligent animals, so this is especially maddening for them. Uh, and so <clears throat> again, we see the pregnant pregnant bodies and female bodies in the animal industries are highly, highly exploited. This image is from a puppy mill. Um, a lot of dogs are purposely bred in puppy mills to satisfy the demand for purebred animals. Um, and these females will be kept in these cages their entire lives, and a lot of them exhibit um, cage madness because they have no stimulation. Um, they'll have problems with their feet and other veterinary problems because they're trapped in these cages for years and years and years. Um, so again, 
we see the female body, pregnant body that's been exploited for capitalist gain and for human, human gain, for species gains. Here are some uh, mares that are being used for uh, estrogen production. And this is for, actually for women who go through menopause and uh, pharmaceutical companies use the estrogen in their urine to produce these pills. So it's an uh, interesting intersection between the uh, medicalization of femininity using the exploitation of female bodies. <clears throat> so menopause, of course, is just a natural process that women go through, and pharmaceutical companies have exploited that and created it into uh, like a medical problem. And you see that a lot with um, marginalized uh, populations. Anyway, to produce this estrogen, these mares are kept in, they're pregnant, by the way. They're kept in these stalls for the entire uh, entirety of their pregnancy. And of course, they're made pregnant over and over again, so they're being raped to produce these, <clears throat> produce this uh, urine. They're deprived of water so that the urine is super concentrated as well. So it's an extremely uh, cruel situation. So while a female body, especially pregnant bodies, tend to be very, very exploited in animal industries. Of course, male animals are also uh, experiencing systematic violence just based on being male. So some of the uh, different issues I'm going to cover. Bulls and pigs are castrated at birth to increase their market weight so that they're more manageable as well. Male chicks are killed at birth because they're not really uh, valued um, because they can't lay eggs. Male dogs are often left unneutered to protect their masculinity or what generally it is the masculinity of their so-called owners. Male dogs, horses, and other domesticates are kept as studs. And of course, male deer, turkey, and other domesticated free-living non-humans are uh, particularly prized victims in hunting. Okay, so here is a piglet who's been castrated. Uh, generally, they do not use anesthesia when they perform this process, and it's done on all little babies. Uh, some with cows as well. Basically what happens is if the animal has been neutered, so to speak, then they will put on more weight and then they're, they have less testosterone issues and so they're eat more easily uh, exploited and oppressed. The reason that male chicks have it so bad simply because they were born male is because they are basically useless to the industry. So here's an image from Farm Sanctuary showing uh, just some of the discarded male chicks. Um, there's several ways that they do this <clears throat> because there's just millions and millions and millions, literally billions each year. They just simply toss them into a trash bin for them to suffocate under the weight of their brothers or they're ground alive in industrial grinders. I've also seen uh, videos of turkey male chicks who've just been all tossed in paper, plastic bags and the plastic bag is tied off so they suffocate in that. So it's an especially gruesome process. Again, we cannot ignore the gendered aspect of this because simply because they were born male and they do not have the necessary reproductive uh, capabilities to produce eggs, uh, that's why they're discarded. So there's been a little bit of sociological research about um, the gender of, the, of companion animals and the gender of the so-called owner. Um, generally what we see is if we have a male owner and a male dog or any other animal, it will be treated differently based on gendered expectations and gender roles. So we impose our gender role norms, norms onto companion animals. Uh, so a lot of times you'll see with these um, purebred dogs, especially the so-called masculine breeds like Dobermans and Rottweilers and German Shepherds and Pit Bulls, etc., they will not be neutered simply because you know they might see that as a, they might see them as stud animals, but they also feel like you know that will be emasculating if they were to neuter the dog. And so because of these gendered expectations we have about even our companion animals, uh, we see a lot of it, irresponsible breeding. All breeding is irresponsible because there are millions of dogs and cats that are being put down or killed rather in shelters every year. So all breeding is irresponsible. So what we have is breeding because people want to have more purebred animals. But also these dogs, if even if it's not intentional, the dog's out in a park or the dog gets loose and then they're 
uh, getting together with female dogs that are unneutered. So it's adding to the pet overpopulation problem. So because of these gendered expectations that we uh, impose on animals. All right, so here is a turkey farm <clears throat> where a man is um, milking the turkeys, I guess you could call it. Basically, these turkeys are being electrocuted, which will make them ejaculate, then the sperm is collected, and then they will go forcibly impregnate uh, female turkeys. And so we see uh, especially horrific uh, means of torture for these animals. All, all of it is torture. All of it is torture, even on so-called happy farms or free range or what have you. All of this is exploitation and oppression. But uh, just one indication of how we cannot uh, forget about the gendered aspect of how we treat animals and how uh, their their specific gender or their sexual identity is going to have a part to play in how they're being exploited. So here we have turkeys who are having their genitals electrocuted so that they will uh, ejaculate. And of course, um, one of the probably one of the most easy to think of ways that a male animal would be uh, especially targeted by human interests would be in hunting, so-called hunting. Uh, because even though there's a lot of myths behind the purpose of hunting for population control, of course it's not substantiated. You know, they technically, if that were the real issue, they would be going after the female animals, which they don't. For the most part, it is the male animals, the bigger, the better, the healthier, that's what's going to be most prized. So deer, elk, and any other animal that's targeted for this uh, exploitation. The gender matters once again. It's um, going to make a difference if male, if it's male or fa he or she is a male or a female. Okay, and so another way that we gender our uh, interactions with other animals is the language that we use. You heard me just now. I slipped up and said it. Um, when we call other animals it's we render them genderless. And of course, the way we treat them is not genderless. It's a very gendered uh, process, the institution of speciesism. Um, so when we call animals it, it turns them into commodities, it turns them into personless objects, and it's easier to otherize them. <clears throat> and another thing that we, another way that we um, replicate the speciesism, speciesism is through using non-human animal names as insults, and a lot of the times they tend to be associated with gender stereotypes. So weasel, rat, pig, whale, dog, stallion, chick, bitch, etc. We hear those words and they have gendered connotations to them. And so we have two things going on. First off, we, it's, it's speciesist when we use this language because it uh, uses their identity as other animals as an insult, which means if, you are used, if your identity is being used as an insult, and it really gives an idea of where you stand on the hierarchy of concern in human society. And then when we use it as a gendered insult, we can see the intersections of how um, when we target marginalized groups and use these names against them, it's saying that we see you at the same level as this lower stratum of beings in our hierarchy of concern. So a lot of times you will see these, these connections. Sometimes it, sometimes it can kind of be used in a positive way, sometimes like social butterfly or stallion, things like that are kind of not necessarily negative, but again, it's very objectifying, it's stereotyping language, uh, and we know in sociology that there, there are plenty of positive stereotypes, but a stereotype is still a stereotype, and it tends to uh, otherize a group. Okay, so to summarize the main points of this mini lecture, um, as a group, female non-human animals experience the greatest affront to their rights as individuals because they uh, have the ability to have, to have children, to have offspring, to be pregnant, um, and to produce lactations, to produce ovulations. So that makes them highly valued as an exploit exploit exploitatable uh, resource, as an exploitatable group. So female non-human animals are objectified and their reproductive systems are exploited. But of course, male non-human animals can also suffer from masculine gender role expectations. And our interactions with non-human animals reinforce the gender roles that we place on non-humans. 
So in the next series, uh, next lecture of this series, I'm going to explore that intersection a little bit more and talk about how um, not just non-human animals suffer because of gendered expectations and gender norms, but also it intersects with how we treat marginalized human groups, specifically women. So in closing, I'm going to leave you with some discussion points um, to help you think through some of the information I've just presented. Think about how we project our human roles, human gender roles, onto non-human animals. How have the non-humans in your life experienced gender? Uh, what about your cats, your dogs, or any other animals that you come in contact with? How do you interact with them differently based on gender role norms that you've internalized? 